Um, I'm going to welcome everybody um, to a, another exciting evening of commissioner meetings. Um, and we're going, to, uh, uh, let's see, we're going to need a, a disclosure for an executive uh, session that we just ended. Board met in executive session prior to this evening's public meeting to discuss personnel, potential litigation, matters which if discussed in public would violate a lawful privilege, and information related to the negotiation of a collective bargaining agreement. Thank you. Uh, again, I hope everybody's doing well. Um, public Safety Committee, uh, Commissioner Brockington is going to lead that discussion. Good evening, thank you, President Norris. Uh, good evening, everyone. We're gonna open our meeting up for, this, for tonight, um, June 19th, um, for Public Safety. So we will start off with our illustrious police chief, Chief Fry. Take it away, sir. All right. Uh, good evening, everyone. So evening. the uh, item A on the agenda is the police clearance and juvenile contact reports for the month of April of 2021. Um, Are there attached to the yeah. agenda? Did you have any questions? Any questions for the chief for his report? Questions for the chief. Commissioner Zygmuntow. Good evening, chief. Thank you, as usual. Um, a couple of questions. I noticed in the categories across the board in theft, retail theft and auto theft, dramatically lower numbers in 2021 versus 2020. Um, are we continuing to see that as a result of COVID? Are there different things going on? Just want to get a read on that. No, I mean, if you look at, um, if you look at April of last year, we had 81 thefts. I don't know if you recall last year when we had that um, that uh, incident in Newark Gardens where we had about 70 garages broken into in a matter of a couple of days. So that's that's reflective. That was an aberration. Right. That's reflective in that 81 okay. from last year to the eight this year. Um, so it's it, it's still lower, but um, that that 81 throws it off. Okay. Uh, the other question I had was, our domestic disturbance numbers continue to run about 33% higher. Uh, I'm assuming, you know, we've talked about this before. Is that a continuing result of COVID more than, than other of, uh, of the categories? I, I, don't, I don't think it's attributed to COVID. I mean, um, you know, the, when, when we were under the lockdown uh, orders, I think that may have, uh, you know, contributed to a spike, but now that we're not, it's just, uh, you know, it's something that's just really not predictable as far as, you know, you know how many domestics we have. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Commissioner. And are there any other questions in reference to the first item on our agenda? Okay. Commissioner Rappaport? Thanks. Well, I, along, along with Commissioner Sigmundfeld, I was looking at those, and what I was wondering about is it looked like the total police services to date are much higher than they were last year. A am I right? And that kind of, um, well, I, you know, I'll, I'll leave it to you. Yeah. yeah, so, I mean, that's, that's also, when you look at April, you know, Mar we started with COVID in March and then, you know, April kind of uh, shut everything down. So, um, you know, we, we made some changes as far as, you know, um, our procedures and, uh, you know, we did see a drop in, in total police services, but, um, you know, the, the number on the left is more, is more typical. I think, uh, that 1300 in, in April of last year was reflective of the time that we were in. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Commissioner Rappaport. Any other questions from commissioners in reference to the police chief's report? All right, hearing none, I call for the, um, the approval of the police clearance and juvenile um, contact report for the month of April, 2021. Dan? Oh, tonight you want my, <laughs> all, yeah. all those in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. <clears throat> Chief, you want to hit the second? You can do the rest also. Well, I will. Item B is uh, the consider recommending the Board of Commissioners adopt a resolution honoring Edward Florendo upon his retirement after more than 31 years of dedicated service to Cheltenham Township, uh, to the Cheltenham Township Police Department at the June 16th 
Board of Commissioners meeting. Any questions? Hearing you seeing none, I call for the approval. I, I would just like to say, uh, when we have a police officer serve Cheltenham for 31 years, it absolutely deserves a, uh, a resolution mm -hmm. honoring him. So uh, yes. I wholeheartedly support that. All, all those in favor say aye. 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 All right, uh, moving on, I don't see this. Consider yeah. recommending the Board of Commissioners yeah. adopt a resolution honoring Daniel Lanuti upon his retirement after more than 26 years of dedicated service to the Cheltenham Township Police Department at the June 16th Board of Commissioners meeting. Chief, Chief could give, he could Dan, give us five more years. Yeah, he, he's, he's doing a great job. You tell him we're voting against this. He's got to stick around five more we'll, years. We want 31. <laughs> tell him. We, slacker. <laughs> we will miss him. We will miss him. Yeah. He really is, he's very helpful yeah. in the community. Yeah, we'll, he, we'll, is. He, he is. Bad. He is. We're he really is. Terrific. All okay. Those, call, all those in ahead, favor Steve. say aye. 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 Okay, item D is uh, recommend the Board of Commissioners approve a purchase order for Power DMS, the department's policy compliance and online training platform in the amount of $8,785.04 for the period of August 9th of 2021 to August 8th of 2022. It was attached to the agenda. Okay. This was an item that was uh, on the operating budget. Right. And the, the, the invoice is attached. Are there any questions from the commissioners? Hearing or seeing none, I call for the approval of this of item 1D. All those in favor say aye. 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 Great. Okay. Right, so, on, um, uh, item A is the track stop presentation. Lieutenant Snyder is on the call. Um, I will share uh, my screen. There's a PowerPoint that he's going to go through that includes uh, the report that we did. So, um, hopefully, I can do this here. Welcome, Lieutenant Snyder. And thank you. I was going to say you're on mute, but thank you. Good evening. How's everybody? Good evening, Good. Lieutenant Good. Snyder. Thank you for presenting this report to us. This is absolutely, good. absolutely. All right. Can everybody see that? Yep. 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 Looks good. Okay, so this is a uh, presentation on a report that we compiled of all of our traffic stop data for the calendar year of 2020. Uh, next slide, Chief. I'm hitting the up button, it's not working. Try the down button, there we go. Okay, so just a little bit of background on uh, why we're presenting this information. Um, this is completely voluntary on our part. Uh, there's no legislative or statutory requirement for us to report this. Uh, however, as everybody's aware, we are extremely committed to transparency. Uh, and this has been the most comprehensive review and analysis of our traffic stop data ever. Um, approximately uh, 75 to 80 man hours went into crunching the numbers here, going through the data and presenting the report that we're presenting to you tonight. Next slide. So why are we doing this? Uh, so we wanted to review the data to identify any trends that have developed, uh, address any potential questionable practices, uh, to provide intervention if necessary via corrective measures, and again, to ensure transparency. Next slide. So the important thing to note is the context and the limitations of what we're presenting. Um, the biggest thing is there's no way that we will ever know the racial composition of the motoring public. Uh, basically, there's no way we will ever be able to know scientifically the racial makeup of the drivers that drive our roads. Uh, we can estimate that based on census data and things like that. However, it is not scientific. Uh, and there's been a lot of research done by various uh, educational institutes that basically say you cannot use the census data of a of a municipality to basically say that's the same as the racial makeup of the drivers. It doesn't take into account transient drivers, people that are driving through our township. Uh, it doesn't take into account the driving age. The census doesn't break down uh, population by driving age, people that are between the ages of 17 and say 70. And the biggest thing to pay, make note of, and I'm gonna present this in a little bit, is over 80% of the people we stop do not live in Cheltenham. Um, they either live there, they, they live outside the township and are either driving through or um, some other reason why they're on our roadways. And again, the, the best guess is not scientific and we don't want to guess when it comes to things like this. 
Next slide, Chief. So what can we analyze? All right. Uh, researchers have been looking at this, and these are the things they look at to determine um, what, if, if racial profiling exists in a police department or if there's a disparity in race. And it's the warning to citation rate broken down by race. Basically, is one race receiving a higher proportion of citations uh, versus warnings? Um, the ratio of stops that lead to searches, basically uh, what percentage of a particular race is being stopped and then leading to a search. And if that, if those numbers aren't the same for a particular race, that could be indicative of racial profiling. And then stop rates during daylight and darkness. Uh, as I'm sure you can imagine, it's easier to determine the race of someone during the daytime when it's, when, when it's bright versus uh, at night. Next slide, Chief. So just to give a little bit of perspective, um, these are the average daily traffic counts from PennDOT of some of the busier roadways in our township. And for instance, the uh, distal end of 309 uh, down by Ogons Avenue, almost 150% of our township's population by number would drive that roadway every day. 51,000 people uh, drive along Ogons Avenue every day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. Uh, and you can also see, you know, Cheltenham Avenue, Old York Road, uh, Township Line Road, they all have 20,000 or higher vehicles per day that, that traverse those roadways. Next slide, Chief. Uh, we were hoping to have 2020 census data to put on this report. However, as I'm sure you know, uh, the federal government has not released it yet. So we're using 2010 census data just for information, uh, as well as the racial composition of the school district, just to paint an overall picture of um, the racial makeup of the area. As you can tell, it, we're a very quite diverse region. Um, we border sections of Philadelphia that are 94% black, 92% black, and we border Jenkintown Borough, which is 75% white. Uh, the township itself, uh, approximately one third African-American. Um, so as you can see, depending on where um, uh, where our region is, is, is situated, we do have a very diverse population. Next slide. Another thing we're providing are, are the demographics of people that call the police for assistance. Uh, it's important to note that over 50% of the people that call for police assistance in Cheltenham are people of color. Next slide, please. All right, so what do we have here? So it's a 2020 calendar year. Uh, we included all stops for motor vehicle violations, both moving violations such as stop signs, red lights, speeding, things like that, and equipment violations, burned out headlights, broken taillights, things like that. And we had a total of 1,600 traffic stops in, in 2020. And as you can, as I'm sure you know, that number is way down from a typical year because of COVID. Um, previous years, we've been hovering in the 5,000 stops per year range. However, last year due to COVID, we were only at 1,600. Next slide. Uh, we've broken them down by patrol sector. Uh, the police department breaks down Cheltenham Township into 12 distinct geographic zones for patrol purposes, as well as tracking for offenses and you know things of that nature. Um, one thing to note, uh, sector E, which is uh, Basically, it's roughly bounded by Cheltenham Avenue, Ogons Avenue, Washington Lane, and Ashbourne Road. Um, that accounts for almost 20% of the total traffic stops of the township, uh, just due to the the um, the roadways leading out of the large commercial area, you know, Target, Home Depot, Ogons Plaza, things like that. So, uh, we stop a lot of vehicles in that part of the township. Next slide, Chief. As I alluded to before. Um, Almost 81% of the people we stop do not live in Cheltenham. Uh, they live somewhere else and are just traversing through. The uh, citation to warning ratio is fairly constant uh, between residents and non-residents. Uh, you know, so you know we don't treat people any different just because they live here versus if they don't live here. Next slide, Chief. Stops by gender. Uh, again, as you can see, the citation to warning ratio is uh, fairly constant between them. Uh, we average about 44% uh, of people we stop being cited and warning about 56%. So we, we issue more warnings than we do citations. 
Next slide. Breaking down by race, uh, you can see 24.3% uh, white, 61.5% black, 8.4% Hispanic, and 5.8% all others. Uh, and going down the citation to warning ratio, those are fairly constant among all races. Um, uh, there's no discrepancies there. Next slide, please. Adding race and gender. Um, white males, 16.3%. White females, 8%. Black males, 39.4%. Black females, 22.1%. Hispanic males, 5.8%. Hispanic females, 2.6%, and all others, 5.8%. And again, looking at the citation to warning ratio, uh, again, they're within uh, uh, statistical uh, equivalence for statistical uh, significance, so for not having any variances. Next slide. Stops resulting in searches. Uh, the total of 1,600 traffic stops, we searched 58 drivers last year or an average of 3.6%. And the, rate, the rates for all races fell within one standard deviation of that, uh, uh, of that sum. Um, so no one race was outside of one standard deviation of 3.6%. Next slide. Uh, Lieutenant, Lieutenant Snyder. Yes, sir. Yep, just a quick quick question on this. I didn't, I didn't wanna save it to the end and have to go back. No, so, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, can you, I, I wasn't clear on the standard deviation piece of it. Sure. Um, just I'm just eyeballing it. So 58 stops, 33 black males. That looks like I'm just rough math. 50 percent, right? Because it's not it's it's not of the total. It's it, it's of the percentage of that race that was stopped. So 33 of 631, not 33 of. So so we're comparing the total stops for that race to the number of those stops of that race that were searches. Got okay. it. Got it. Okay. Thank you for clarifying. You're welcome. Uh, While you're stopped, excuse me. Um, yes, ma'am. Yeah, there were a couple of things I wanted to ask about earlier slides, but I, I just wonder if you'll be able to give us these slides so we can actually study them after. Oh, the absolutely. Yeah, we have a full six-page report that we'll provide to you um, that has all this information, um, so you'll be able to review it. Thank you. You're welcome. Next slide, Chief. So the veil of darkness test, this was a, uh, a, a statistical test that researchers, I believe at Dartmouth University came out with assessing um, racial profiling of police department traffic stops. Uh, they concluded that if a minority, the, the rate of minority stops during the day were higher when uh, uh, it's easier to determine the race of the operator, that they could say um, that racial profiling exists. As you can see from our statistics, we actually stop more people of color at night when you can't, with, it's much more difficult to tell the race of the operator at night than it is during the daytime. Uh, so we actually have the polar opposite of what they would describe as racial profiling due to that. Next slide, Chief. So just a little bit of discussion. Uh, the major problem we have is there are no standards or benchmarks to, to analyze this data. Um, there's no one way to say you're doing things the right way, you're doing things the wrong way. There's just no way to know. Uh, we can only analyze what we know. Uh, and, and based on those three tests that we showed, um, the, the uh, citation to warning ratio, the stop the search ratio and the veil of darkness test. Those are the three objective things you can use to analyze um, the data. Um, and then that's what, we've, that's what we've done via statistics. Next slide. Lieutenant please. Snyder. Yes, sir. Uh, just a question. On the, this, this clearly helps give us insights on the aggregate, but on specific officers, particularly when you're tracking their behaviors, do you find deviations or st statistical differences with particular officers that in fact could be attributed to, you know, it doesn't necessarily be profiling, they could be more attuned to certain kinds of stops, et cetera. But I think one of the things that we'd look for in this data, not so much for, for us, but for you is to know that there are sometimes the need for intervention or retraining where you do notice 
a significant variance in, in a particular group of officers' behavior. So I just want to know if, if that's also accounted for. Yes, that's actually a component of our accreditation report. Uh, as part of our accreditation, we have to evaluate every officer in the aggregate to determine if they are statistically outside the probability of the rest of the department. So basically, if there's one officer that has a completely disproportionate number of stops to the rest of the officers, that will be something we need to intervene with. Uh, but we do an annual uh, report on that for the purpose of accreditation. Can you, without, you know, obviously we're not looking for names, but with, with you, you know, the, the number of officers that you have, have you had to do interventions with any meaningful number of, of your police officers, you know, with this particular issue in mind? No, sir. Uh, we have never identified an issue of racial profiling with any of our officers here. Uh, we've not gotten any complaints about racial profiling, um, yeah, and we've not identified any officers uh, having a pattern of racial profiling. Okay. Thank you. Next slide, Chief. So again, talking about uh, our area here, uh, we are a very diverse area, okay? We, you know, border sections of Philadelphia that are almost exclusively uh, 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 black, and, and then we border Jenkintown that is almost exclusively white. Uh, but the majority of people that call for assistance in Cheltenham are people of color. Uh, and again, the vast majority of drivers stopped in, in Cheltenham are not residents, uh, they reside elsewhere. So again, that, those stops would not reflect Cheltenham's racial composition. Next slide, Chief. So the citation to warning rate, warning rate we discussed uh, is, is statistically equal across all races and genders. Uh, the stop to search rate is also statistically equal across all races and genders. And the veil of darkness test shows where there's no increase in the stop rate of people of color during daylight hours. Next slide, Chief. As I'm sure you know, we are committed to complete transparency. Uh, we are an accredited law enforcement agency that follows the industry's best practices. Uh, we have a prohibition of bias-based policing and we require uh, annual uh, anti-bias training. Uh, next slide, Chief. <laughs> so at this time, are there, are there any questions? Yeah, I have a small one. Yes, sir. Lieutenant, um, the veil of darkness. Yes, sir. Uh, are there any applications in there about heavily tinted windows where you also can't see into the car? It's so difficult to, that's not a metric that we would have to track that in real time. Basically the officer would have to make a notation of whether or not they knew the operator's race at the time of the stop. Um, <clears throat> but, but, but not knowing that, like going back and reviewing reports, there's no way to know that uh, in the, you know, without doing it in, in, in real time. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Um, sure. Yeah, Lieutenant Snyder, a great report, much appreciated. We appreciate the transparency, the information, uh, and frankly, the good work that you and the police department do. Um, so uh, perhaps a self-serving question. Is, is the police department permitted to give favoritism to residents? Specifically commissioners, but let's start with residents. <laughs> <laughs> So, so as part of our, as I'm sure you know, our, our, our oath of office uh, uh, precludes us from taking pretty much consideration of, uh, of, of any personal factor into how we enforce the law. So uh, we enforce the law objectively, no matter where the person lives, um, you know, what kind of car they're driving, anything like that. So, so those, uh, we do not take into consideration whether or not when we make a stop versus warning decision. All right. I'm sorry hi, to hear that, but thank you. Lieutenant yes, Snyder, this is, hi, this is Commissioner Brockington. Yes, sir. Um, I was sort of writing some notes down. I, I'm, I'm looking forward to sort of digesting the whole report. Um, the one thing that I noticed that I guess being a father of three daughters, uh, you know, the numbers you had for white women being pulled over was 8% and black females was 22%, which seems to really be a, a, a big difference for in my eyes that absolutely that big you know is I, I see I don't know if you want to use the word privilege or I, I'm I'm so uncomfortable when I see that that 22 to 8 that's a big difference in in you know getting pulled over 
in our sure. township. So I'm a little concerned about that. Well, and again, going back to the beginning of the report, we don't, that may be a completely proportionate number of stops. We just don't know the racial composition of the people on our roads, mm -hmm. you know, and, 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 and we will never know that. There's short of looking at every vehicle for a statistically significant <clears throat> period of time and identifying the race of every driver. There's no way for us to know. Um, you know, we were providing some background to, to make an educated guess, but again, we, we don't know. You know, all, all we can do is look at how we treat people after we stop them. Um, there's, again, no way for us to know what is proportionate and what isn't proportionate prior to the stop, if that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. And I would like you to make this presentation at the July Civil Rights Task Force meeting. Um, absolutely. You, can, you know, I'll yeah, give absolutely. the dates and stuff to you, but I, I would like it. Yeah, absolutely. No problem. Here. Thank yeah. you. Any other Request. questions from the commissioners? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. I'm sure. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'll, go, I'll go after. I'll go after Matt. Go ahead, Commissioner Armin. Thank, thank you, and Lieutenant Snyder. Thank you for this report. Um, just a couple of quick questions. You had suggested in the beginning that this is the most comprehensive report um, that Chunhan Township Police Department has undergone. Is this something that we're planning to do? Uh, uh, yearly going forward, because it seems to me, uh, and, and this sort of dovetails with my second question, it seems to me that um, this sort of data is um, useful uh, in, in a, a, an annual, from an annual sort of overview, but it probably becomes more useful over time, right? Using Absolutely. baselines Absolutely. and going forward. <laughs> Yeah, if we, if we can identify trends and benchmarks and things like that over time. I mean, this is a point in space right now, and 2020 was a one-off anyway because of COVID, but uh, we will absolutely be doing this on an annual basis from here going forward. That, that's great. And then you, you hit you hit my second question, which is whether 2020 is really a good baseline year right. because of everything that went on. But my guess is, um, as you do this over time, you'll, you'll I guess we'll find out, right? Um, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and then my my last question is, so we, we sort of have three analysis points. It's the warning versus citation rate, stops leading to searches, and this, um, I, I don't know, know that I love the nomenclature, veil of darkness. Yeah, yeah that, 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 wasn't my, that wasn't my verbiage. But. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think day versus night stops is probably yeah, better. Yeah. But, um, yeah, but, but that being said, um, <laughs> is, there, um, is there a science out there that looks at these statistics and identifies other analysis points that that perhaps we would want to add to future reports. Sure, there's uh, various papers been written by various researchers uh, affiliated with educational institutions, as well as the Department of Justice, uh, examining statistics on a large scale, like talking into the hundreds of thousands and millions of traffic stops. Um, due to our small, relatively small size in the in the grand scheme of things, um, you know just analyzing just the Cheltenham Police Department uh, by, by an outsider, uh, I don't know would be very useful uh, to Got a researcher it. just because our sample size is so small. Um, they're, mm -hmm. used to, they're used to handling sample sizes, like I said, in the, in the six to seven digit number. So, um, but yeah, I mean, there, there are other things we can evaluate just, uh, you, you know, the way our current system is set up, we don't capture a lot of the data that other researchers have used in the past. Um, we're, we're basing this solely off of our records management system, which wasn't set up to do this kind of analysis. Um, we're kind of shoehorning the analysis into what we have uh, already. Sure. Uh, however, we, we are looking at potentially capturing additional data in the future. Uh, it's just going to be a matter of what we can make our records management system do for us. So perhaps th th that's helpful, um, and I appreciate that answer. So perhaps one of the, um, you know, sort of uh, other data points that we should be looking at is what other uh, sorts of data do we need to be capturing in order to have a more robust report year after year, um, and th that may be sort of an internal thing that we can that we should be looking at. And, and obviously, if we need to update the records management system. Uh, then that's perhaps a recommendation that the police department would make to the to the board or something like that. Oh, there we go. Sorry, I was frozen for a second. Oh, that's okay. There we thank go. you. All right, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Commissioner Army. Commissioner Holland? 
Yeah, real, real quick. I just wanted to go back to the sector slide, if we could, Lieutenant. Yes, sir. Uh, Chief, can you go back up to that? And I know, and I know sector E is, um, you know, a very busy sector. That's the sector where I live. So I know, and, and, and a, I guess a sidebar really quickly, um, I've seen an increased presence of uh, officers, you know, sort of, you know, doing their paperwork or, or monitoring traffic in the medians and different places, you know, specifically in that sector. So that, that's, that's great and that's appreciated. Um, and I know that's a, a very busy sector. What, what would be our secondary sort of sector, like what area of the township in relation to what, what letter? So basically, um, with, with, we have a map with this drawn on it, but I, I didn't include it. But essentially, the south half of the township uh, accounts for 63% of our traffic stops. So basically, um, below Ashbourne Road, across basically the width of Cheltenham Avenue, um, would be 63% of our traffic stops. So basically, the part of the township that borders Philadelphia is the busiest for our traffic stops due to where the roadways are located, uh, commercial districts, things like that. Whereas the northern half of the township tends to be more residential, uh, isn't as busy with traffic volume. Um, so those, those stops don't, um, there, there are not as many stops in, in that part of the township. Um, but F sector, for instance, that would be um, basically Township Line Road, Washington Lane, Old York Road, and then down to Church Road. Um, so we get basically those are, those are stops that happen on Old York Road, Ashbourne Road, uh, I'm sorry, Church Road, Washington Lane, and Cash Blind Road. So basically, sectors that have major roadways tend to have the most number of traffic stops, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense. So the, the only thing that I would say to, to just pay attention to, and this is great information, and I appreciate the transparency, um, would be if if 80% of the people that we stop are non-residents, and 60 plus percent of the stops are on the south side of the township. And, you know, I don't know if this is fact or not, but I will go out on a limb and say that because the south side of the township borders a part of Philadelphia that is predominantly African-American, then, and most of our stops are happening on that side of the township, you know, by just numbers, you're going to be stopping more African-Americans than you would in, in other areas of the township. So I would say just, just pay attention to sort of, you know, the part of our township that borders Philadelphia versus the part of the township that borders Jenkintown and how those those two borders play against each other in, in the, the number of stops. And the obviously, because of the location, there will be a difference in the racial composition. But, you know, it, it, you know if, we, if we heavily, heavily stop in one area and, and it's not matched in another area, that could be looked at a certain way sure, um, sure. But, but i get all the traffic is on this side because of the right way right <laughs> yeah okay. it's just i mean it, it's it's, it's basically just a secondary you know it, it's a secondary uh, uh uh issue due to how how the task is configured and that's yeah. basically we we respond to complaints to traffic volume things like that but you typically our stops end up being on the most heavily traveled roadways and that's just how you know it, it's just how it ends up yeah. And, and it just so happens that those heavily trafficked roadways border up a uh, 95% black section of the city. Correct. Correct. So, yeah, I, I get it. But well, thank you. For that. Asking Lieutenant Snyder. Yes, sir. Um, I was wondering in the, the small number of searches that you do, what types of violations have you identified? And typically, you know, what are, what are the, the kinds of attributes of those stops that, that make them a little more, you know, a little more severe, a little more challenging. So we require all of our officers to document their specific objective reasonings for either requesting a search or searching a vehicle. Uh, you know, we don't search cars based on hunches. We don't search cars based on, you know, hairs in the back of your neck. The officer has to have objectively reasonable uh, uh, reason to search a vehicle. Uh, you know, typically it would be for the odor of narcotics, uh, odor of marijuana, or uh, something in plain view, a firearm, something like that. Um, uh, we didn't for this, but we can actually go back and look and, and, and see what the searches were for. Um, that was a kind of a last minute addition to the report. And as I'm sure you know, our records administrator had a very severe case of COVID um, that he tragically almost died from. Uh, so at a time we were able to get a part-time person to do his job for us, 
we were well into this year. So this, we would have liked to have had this data out a lot earlier, but we were um, behind the eight ball with getting it collected. Sure, and, and just to pick up on your comment, with the expanding use of medicinal marijuana, does that change the guidelines? In fact, for that, the way that you proceed when you do quote unquote sense or, or identify that odor or whatever. Oh, absolutely. You know, if, 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 if we do detect an odor of marijuana, but the person you know, has a medical marijuana card or identifies themselves as having a medical marijuana card, uh, we can't use that as a reason to search the vehicle. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi, Lieutenant Snyder. With the, yes, the, um, what's up here now to stop by patrol sector? I know for me, it would help a little if there was just maybe a, a location next to those alphabets. I mean, absolutely. I know that you guys, I, you guys know it by heart. We live it right. same day, but for us civilians, G and D means nothing. So sure, you could, sure. you know, add some locations next to that. It just gives a little bit of a bite. We yeah, I will. Actually, add a map if you would like. Yeah, uh, with those sectors outlined. Um, okay. It would probably be easier to have a visual. Okay, and then my my last question or second question is. You guys sort of did this on your own, which was really great. This is a really good presentation. How would you guys feel if this was done by an independent party, that it wasn't done by our police checking on our police, that it was if it was done by an independent auditor or someone like that who came in and gathered your numbers? Um, I, I want to know your feeling on that. Because this was basically you guys doing it yourselves, which I'm happy with, but I wanted to know your feelings on that. Yeah, no, we, like I said, we're completely committed to transparency. Um, you know, these are, you know, we, we, we have nothing to hide. So we have, we'd have no issue with having somebody else take a look at the numbers and do their own analysis. I mean, the numbers are the numbers. Um, okay. You know, we, okay. we haven't tweaked or changed or, you know, done anything to, to the raw data. You know, the raw data is the raw data. So, I mean, they can... Okay you know, analyze it in any way that they, that they see fit. Okay. And then um, any other questions from commissioners? So what I'm going to Commissioner, do, I'm going to take uh, Commissioner I, I keep Rappaport. Trying. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> but I couldn't see you. No, that, I, well, I, I had a few earlier, but I'll, I'll postpone those for another time. Uh, first of all, thank you, Lieutenant, for the presentation. Really appreciate it. I'm curious as well um, about how those numbers would look if we divided moving violations from equipment. You said at the beginning that this included uh, all of them put together. And I wonder if there are any differences, and I don't expect you to answer this tonight, but I wonder uh, if it would look pretty much the same and also by sector number. Um, and while we're talking about um, you know, the stops uh, uh, in relating to the volume of traffic. And I suspect we have a lot of traffic coming off of uh, 309, coming into the township and, and all that. So I would think, and up Easton Road and Lime Hill Pike, um, I don't know, I, at, and of course our state, you know, the state roads, uh, uh, so I'm curious also uh, about the, the sectors and if the sectors are actually patrolled in a sense with the same uh, with the same priority in a sense. You know, you, you talked sort of about the expectation that certain sectors are going to have more traffic, more you know, whatever, because they're in a certain place. And I just wonder if that also colors the, the way the numbers actually fall out. You know, we know that expectations is going to, you know, might, might change what we look for and therefore what we stop. So the way so we I'll deploy, just to, just to put things in perspective, so the way we deploy our officers, um, every officer is assigned two patrol sectors as their beat. So we don't throw all the officers to one location in the township. They're equally spread out. So every officer assigns their particular sectors. 
Um, so yeah, there's going to be some variances based on traffic volume, but we expect every officer to patrol their sector with the same level of, of, uh, aggression. I, I, I hate to use the word aggression, but not as, 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 as thoroughly as they would for, for every, for every sector. Like we, you know, we don't expect a guy to go to a certain sector and not do anything. All right. We, we expect every officer to, to, um, um, to patrol their sectors equally, if that makes sense. Thank you. Irv, back to you. You're on mute, though. Commissioner, any other questions from commissioners? All right. Seeing no questions from the commissioners, I will take the liberty um, to open this up maybe for at least about 15 minutes from um, questions from the public on this presentation. I think it's important that we hear from our residents. So Ashley, can you um, see if anyone has their hand raised? We will try to do some questions. Um, our first resident is Philip Stein. Mr. Stein, how you doing? How you doing? Hi, Irv. Good, good. Hi, oh, Stein. I have a question. Th thanks for getting all this together. Uh, actually, two questions. What one is? Do we know how this compares to other nearby townships? And then the other question is: Do we track people that just get warnings? Yeah, you know, thinking about people that repetitively drive like nuts through here. Yeah. So uh, as of right now, we're the only township that's collecting and publicizing this data. So we can't really compare ourselves to anybody else right now. Yeah, thank you. And uh, as far as repeat offenders go, if we're, we, we keep track of people, we stop. So if the officer sees he stopped the, somebody, another officer stopped the, the, that particular person for the same offense previously, there's a higher likelihood the second or third time he's going to get cited as opposed to getting warned. Right, good. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Allison, any other questions from the residents? Uh, yes. Uh, Liza Maris? Liza, how are you? Hi, I'm great. Thanks. Okay. Um, Lieutenant, first, let me just say thank you for putting all this together. I know exactly what it's like to put together data like this, and I believe you when you say it was that many hours. Thank you so much for doing this and being transparent. Um, it, it's just really great. And, and as was stated, you know, this is very forward in comparison to other police departments. And I, I really just want to say that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So I'm looking at your purpose, right, that you stated at the beginning of the presentation. And the first two were to review data to identify trends and then address any potential questionable practices. And then the third one was to intervene if necessary. And my question is this, um, when you were looking at the data as a police department, um, and you were looking at this 80% of people pulled over were non-residents. And I know that you guys knew that before. So my question is, when you talk about this or when you look at this number, what do you think the reason is for that percentage of people pulled over to be non-residents? And I guess the follow-up to that, speaking to the second and third point is, are we concerned, right? Are we comfortable with 80% of the people we pull over being from Philadelphia? Um, it, or is that something that we want to change? Is that something we're comfortable with? And I think that sort of hinges on what your answer is as to what you think the reasoning for that is. So a couple of the reasons that, that, that we believe are, are, are paramount to that are the 309 Expressway. Uh, you know, like I said before, we have 50,000 people per day that drive down that road uh, either in, in either direction most likely not residing in Cheltenham. They are using 309 to come through Cheltenham to either get into Philadelphia or to leave Philadelphia and go to points north. Um, Old York Road is the same way. Uh, it's a major artery in and out of Philadelphia. Uh, Cheltenham Avenue, again, major artery east-west. Uh, depending on what side of the street you're on, you're either in Philadelphia or you're in Cheltenham. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, we kind of have this influx with a lot of, with a lot of drivers. Um, so, we're, we're comfortable saying that that, that that proportion is not an issue for concern. Thank you. In the chat, you, Liza. Ms. Ms. Davidson has a couple of questions. In the... Okay. Hi. Hi, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so, if, if Johnny, um, it feels like Lieutenant Snyder, you're saying that racial bias doesn't play a part in this, but we have 
black females and black males are pulled over greater than any other race. Depend, it doesn't matter if it's day or night, actually. And then they are also searched more often, right? So if it's not racial bias, what is it? Like, what what makes these black people get pulled over more? I don't I don't know what you're the what they're being stopped for. That's not part of your stats. So I don't know what traffic stop means, but I, I can't if race doesn't play a part, I can't understand what is happening that would make at year after year black people be pulled over more. And not just in Cheltenham, uh, in the US. But I do want to hear about what you think, Lieutenant Senator, for Cheltenham. So we'll go to searches first. Uh, it's statistically insignificant, the difference between races. Uh, uh, the, it's, like I said, less than one standard deviation, which from a statistical perspective is insignificant. Uh, it's basically um, the element of chance. Um, once you get outside of one standard deviation, uh, then you start to see patterns. Uh, but when all of them fall into within one standard deviation of each other, it's statistically insignificant. Going back to your other comment about the racial composition of the people we stop, we don't know if that's outside the norm. We don't know the, the, the proportion of the motoring public. That could be perfectly equivalent to the people that drive our roadways. We just don't know that. We'll never know that. We'll never know the proportion of the people that drive in Cheltenham. Uh, there's just no way to, 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 with a reasonable degree of certainty, say what that makeup is. Okay, so so if 50%, I mean, I, I have my stats that you gave me before in 2019. So I, I'm to believe that fifth, everywhere I drive in Cheltenham, or average day, most of the drivers are black. And that is why, that is the only reason why most people stopped are black. Correct. Half of them, not necessarily most of them. Right. No, it's most. If you add up black males and females, it's most. Anything over 50 is most. And then compare, you're breaking down white is like 29% or whatever. I have to take my time to look at the stats, but it's most. So I just, it's, I believe racial bias has to play a part. And then the veil of darkness. I mean, you were, it was, you're stopping more black people. I didn't understand how that slide, like I heard what you said, but it didn't, to me, it, you were like, Chel not you, Cheltenham Police Department is stopping more black people during the day than night. You have to look at the proportions. You have, to help me understand it. you have to look at the proportions, not the numbers. Okay. Uh, because we, as a department, we stop, we do more traffic stops during the daytime as a whole. Okay? okay. You can't just take the number. You have to look at the proportions, the percentages, the, the compositions of those stops of during the daytime versus the proportionate makeup of those stops at night. And we stop proportionately more African-Americans at night than we do during the daytime. And you, it's almost impossible uh, to tell the race. Why? Because that's not how I understood it. Sure. Chief, can you pull that back up, please? There we go. Okay. So look at the percentages. Mm -hmm. Okay. During the daytime, 36.2% are black male. At night, 44.3% are black males. So we're right. stopping. So we're stopping proportionately more black males at night than we are during the daytime. Okay. When it's more difficult to determine the race of the driver, as as a police officer, you know, I'm a 17 year veteran of this police department. It is almost impossible to tell the race of a driver prior to walking up to the window. I mean, I can guarantee you that it's it, it it's just the way it is. And at night, it's 99.99% impossible to tell the race of the driver before you make contact with them. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Uh, but again, like the numbers are still just, uh, I just, it's hard for me to believe that we have, if you add up 349 plus 206 for the daytime, right? If you add up the right. black that were stopped versus the whites were stopped, I just don't think that just matches our, matches the population of wherever they're from. Well, again, you're, you're also looking at the totality of the circumstances. You're looking at where the stops happen and, 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 and like, you know, uh, you have to look at the racial composition, too, of, of, of the areas that border us, not just Cheltenham. Um, right. So maybe it'll help me if I know what people are stopped for. 
that's something that we didn't go back and pull each one because we would have to literally pull every single report and put the reason. And that's for a light year, 1,600 traffic stops, you know, next year or this year, there could be 5,000 reports would have to go through and list each reason why that person was stopped. Well, right. And then maybe it's gotta be an examination. Like, okay, if you, if it's hard to tell me, but then you could stop. If someone has a broken tail light, it's not a reason to stop them, right? Like if this is what's leading to more black people being stopped, I don't know. It just, it just, it feels like change has to be made in order for this world to be a fair place for everyone. Um, and so like, I just, I just have to understand why I, I don't believe black people are inherently worse drivers. So that doesn't explain it. I don't believe Black people have more broken taillights than white people. Like I just, I can't. So let me, so let me, let me make sure I understand you. You, you believe that we are disproportionately targeting minorities for traffic stops. Is that, is that your belief? Yeah, when I because you sometimes you want me to look at stats, sometimes you don't. But looking at stats, you're, you're saying. I'm, I'm sorry. When, when did I ever tell you we didn't want you to look at last, stats? The last meeting I was on, Chief Fry didn't want me to only go by statistics, right? Like I have to know more about it. And so I'm trying to know more, but then to know a specific example, I, I won't know the specific example of why someone was stopped. That's not something that's kept, but, but I mean, there, I don't, I don't know. I just see more black people stopped. I can, I can read the numbers right here. So, so Lieutenant, uh, Lieutenant Snyder, if I may. Um, So let me, let me ask a question following on Miss Davidson's question. So, um, Understanding that we don't know the the demographics of the driving public, right? Yeah. Um, which which could, if the if the demographics are skewed in one direction, um, male, female, um, people of color versus um, white folks, uh, or whatever that demographic is, that could have an impact on these statistics. Fair. That, that's, that's sort of the, the, the base, the, yes, the, the point that you made up front. But it seems to me that um, uh, unless we have evidence that the driving public changes over time, presumably the driving public demographics remain the same. And it would make it, so it's hard to determine in this one year snapshot whether there is. Um, uh, really sort of um, conclusions that could be drawn on that on that basis. It would have to be over time, again, assuming the demographics stay the same over time, that if we see trends, that therefore there may be some conclusions that could be made about motivations or not or lack thereof. But but here it seems to me it's hard, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, it's hard to sort of attribute a motivation in a one-year snapshot unless we have data to compare it to. Absolutely. But the, the one thing we're trying to hammer home, though, is that the researchers have developed these metrics as far as how people are treated after the stop to, to determine whether there's racial profiling based on those responses. So that's why we use the stop to citation ratio, the stop to search ratio. Uh, and, and again, you know, if we stopped you know, if our average was 3.6% for searches, but we stopped, we searched African-American men at a rate of 20%, that would obviously be something that we would need to intervene on immediately. However, we don't see that here. Same thing with citations to warnings. If we were doing, if we stopped, you know, looking at our, our African-American males, if we issued them 80% of those stops, we issued them citations, that would be a problem. If we also... 80% of those stops were warnings. That would also be a problem because that would possibly mean that it wasn't a real offense. We Correct. were just stopping them just to see what was going on. So Correct. by having consistent ratios across all races and sexes, we're confident that that is not a problem. Um, Lieutenant. Thank yes, you. Ma'am. Also, just to follow up and going back to my one of my questions, if we just did the same report for moving violations or for moving, I think it would also help clarify some of the questions of bias that we've heard, you know, throughout 
yeah, say the last couple of decades. Um, and again, as Commissioner Harmon said, over time, not necessarily in one time, but I think, I think sorting out the differences between equipment and moving uh, concerns would also add to, to uh, uh, the information and the ability to absolutely. interpret. Yeah, and that's something we could absolutely do. Uh, we just didn't do for this report, but yeah, we can, we can right. absolutely do right. that. I understand. Brockington. Sorry, I was on mute. I apologize. Are there any other uh, questions from any residents? Allison, any questions? Uh, no, I don't see any. Okay. All right. Thank you, um, Lieutenant. Well, I, I guess I do. Is there any way this report? can be broken down to who was pulled over for equipment violation as opposed to a traffic violation. So unfortunately, the way our records management system, when an officer enters a report for a traffic stop, it only says it's for a traffic stop. We would have to go back to each report and then throw it into either category. Um, it would be extremely time consuming. We, we could do it. Uh, however, currently going forward, we can look at starting to capture that data, but going back and doing it retrospectively would be very onerous. I, I would like to have that information like going forward because as a resident said, you know, someone's taillight being out should not reflect their race. You know, it's not going to be all black people, you know, your, your taillight's going to be broken more than someone who's white. So I think having that information would be really helpful but it's telling us you know basically why you're pulling people over um and we definitely want you to make sure that people are driving our roads safely and are not violating any any laws but you know again my concern is i see just a, a, a major difference in people of color being pulled over in our township and then people who are not of color and they drive our roads too and they go to work, they come home, they go to lunch, they go to the store, but there's a bigger chance that um, someone of color will be pulled over by our, um, per this report, without, without a doubt. But I appreciate this report. I think every commissioner does. I know you put a lot of time and effort into it. And again, I would definitely like you to make a presentation at the Civil Rights Task Force meeting. And, Absolutely. and you know, I think that our residents who are involved with traffic calming, a lot of time they're saying we want more enforcement, we, they want more enforcement of speeders. And I think we all want that in the township. But um, as, as a person of color, I just wanna make sure that our officers are trained and they're not um, targeting um, people of color for driving through our township. Um, you know, many who live here and work here, I, I want them to feel um, safe in the knowing that unless I do something wrong, I won't get pulled over in Sheltonham. And hopefully, and, you know, that I, I feel that's what I want. And, and we've, we've, we've demonstrated this to red to, to concerned residents. Also, we, we've, we've taken them out on ride alongs and showed them how extremely difficult it is to determine the race of the driver before mm -hmm. you stop them. You know, I mean, you, you can do it yourself. Pull up behind somebody at a traffic light and say, what's the race of this person in front of me? Right. You know, or well, somebody, I mean, yeah. somebody blows a red light in front of you. There's there's mm -hmm. no way for you to know that. You know, it's mm -hmm. and, and, you know, sure, there's there, there's times where the officer will know the race of the driver. Sure. Right. To the top, but mm -hmm. the vast majority of the times, it's it's impossible to determine that ahead of time. Okay. No. All right. Great. Any other comments from commissioners? Okay. Thank you, Lieutenant um, Snyder. Thank you, sir. Report. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. All right. So we're going to go on to item 1F, Chief, um, the update on the MOU. Did that go off? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, you, know, you know, Chief, before you go, 
Emily Steinberg has her hand up and I don't want to, and I don't know, em Emily, do you still have a question? Um, I don't have a question. I just, I just have a comment. Um, and so believe it or not, I'm going to be 57 years old this year, which I can't believe. And um, pretty much for the last, since 1980, which is where, where are we since 1980? Like 40 years? <laughs> We've been dealing with a lot of these issues. Um, and in terms of, um, my feeling is in terms of traffic safety and people like being pulled over and so forth and so on. I mean, my, my compatriots and I have been trying for two and a half years to get the police to pull people, people over. So to get them to kind of slow people down and so on and so forth. So I don't think it's a racial thing. I do not think it's a racial thing. I think that when, and correct me if I'm wrong, but if someone's doing something, they're pulled over. If somebody's driving appropriately or whatever, they're not. I do not, I don't, I, I refuse to believe and call me naive, but in this day and age, I think Cheltenham has an incredibly uh, sensitive and evolved police department. And I do not believe that they are racial profiling people. And that's just my feeling. Now I could be completely wrong. Um, and that's just, I just have to get that out there. I just, you know, if I'm out there going 75 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone, someone's going to pull me over and guess what? I deserve it. For that input, and that, that's my comment. Thank you, thank you, Emily. All right, Chief, we're going to go move on to the, uh, the MOU with the school district. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to touch on um, uh, the, the updated MOU and uh, make some other comments um, after after that um, regarding some information that was put out. Uh, so. Um, the MOU, as everybody knows, is, um, is an agreement with us in the school district. Um, it's uh, renewed every two years. Previously, um, the, the agreement was signed off on by uh, the school superintendent, myself, the school principals, and the district attorney. The district attorney has since um, not required this signature, so it is truly an agreement between the police department and the school district. Um, so just to talk about, um, you know, I'm, I'm addressing the changes that were made to, uh, to the, to the, uh, to the MOU. Back in March, um, Liza, who is on the call, reached out to us. She was been, she was working with a group called Police Free uh, Cheltenham School District. And um, they inquired about some changes to the MOU specifically uh, changes to, um, there's two categories of crime in the MOU that need to be reported. Uh, the mandatory uh, list of crimes and then the discretionary list of crimes. Obviously the mandatory list of crimes are the serious crimes. Discretionary crimes are um, a little less serious in nature. Uh, and they asked if we would consider taking the discretionary crime or the category out of the MOU um, and we looked at it, uh, they were crimes, basically the school district could call us or, or they could not call us. So um, we agreed and we were on board from the very beginning uh, to, to, to work, uh, to make it better, to make the MOU better. Um, I mean, my feeling is, and our feeling is in the police department, the less we're in the schools, uh, the better. I mean, um, we'd like to be in the schools for positive things, not so much for the negative things. Um, so uh, we we did uh, we did agree to take that out. Um, countless drafts were were done. We had meetings. We put a lot of time and effort into into uh, getting the changes done, and um, I believe they were approved um, with some a few minor language changes um, by the school as well. 
Um, so that's that's basically an update on the MOU. Um, what I wanted to do is I just wanted to touch up touch on some information that was put out that I think is misinformation. I think is misleading information. Um, there was an article put out recently, um, basically with some stuff that I have issues with, um, and I, I won't go into it in depth. There's just a couple things I want to touch on. Um, as I said, the police department played a huge part in amending this MOU. We were on board. I don't know how, how, how much the school district was on board in the beginning. Liza could probably talk, talk to that. But uh, as far as I know, we were the first to support these changes. But read that article, you wouldn't know that. Um, so just so everybody knows, uh, we don't patrol the hallways of the schools, disciplining kids in the hallways. Uh, we haven't had an officer in the school since the fall of 2019. Uh, we had to pull our, pull our school liaison officer out of the school due to manpower issues. But even when Officer Hinchy was there, Jackie Hinchy, um, she was very, uh, very popular in the schools. The kids looked up to her. Um, she acted as a mentor to a lot of the kids. The teachers reached out to her on a consistent basis, called her on her cell phone, asked her, uh, you know, ran things by her. So um, she wasn't patrolling the hallways, disciplining the kids. She was there for, for good reasons. Um, I just want to touch on a number in the article. It references that 100% of the arrests in the 18-19 school year were of African-American students. That's correct. Um, however, I always, I always warn about putting numbers out there without any context. And I don't think this was fair to be put in the article without any context. So of those 100%, they were nine incidents and it involved 14 kids being arrested over, over nine incidents. And I'll just go real quick, go through some of those incidents. Um, and, and I just also wanna say that for every one of these, the school district called us. We responded to the school because the school administration called us to the school. So uh, I'll go through the nine incidents. Simple assault, sudden blind attack on another student. Aggravated assault, the kid was trying to put another kid in a trash can. The principal tried to intervene and he shelved the principal to the ground. Aggravated assault, large fight in which a teacher was assaulted and one uh, teacher was injured trying to intervene. We had a terroristic threats arrest for a student who threatened to shoot up the school and uh, was thought that he had a gun in his car. We had a large fight involving four girls that jumped another girl. We made four arrests in that, in that uh, incident. We had a theft with a credit card fraud where a student stole a credit card from a teacher's pocketbook and rung up $300 worth of uh, merchandise. The teacher wanted to pursue that. We had two instances of possession of marijuana in school. Both of those are mandatory reported crimes. We had an institutional vandalism involving three arrests where three kids in a band room discharged the fire extinguisher, had marijuana, and they had a BB gun on their person that resembled a real gun. They caused $1,500 worth of damage to some of the uniforms. So they're the calls that we responded to, um, to the school, not to kids sleeping in class, as it's referenced in the article. Um, you know, a number of these incidents too, there's victims. So the police department has an obligation to protect victims, to stick up for victims and to uh, ensure that they, they receive the justice that they, they, they want. And so for most of these cases, um, two of them in particular, uh, a teacher and a principal wanted to pursue charges. So I just wanted to touch on that. I, I, I thought it was important to clear up, you know, the number that they put out there. It makes the police department look bad, I think, when you put 100% of the arrests with no context. Um, and it doesn't touch on the fact that every time we're there to, for, for an arrest, we're not necessarily walking kids out in handcuffs. We do a lot of them by juvenile petition. And for every single one of them, we're called to the school. Uh, I just I was really disappointed with uh, with that with that article. So I just wanted to I thought it was important to get that information out there. That's all. I Thank have. you, Chief. I, 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 and you did a uh, really excellent job presenting that and getting your side out there. Um, I, I personally want to say and probably, you know, maybe the other commissioners want to check, want to chime in. I'm I'm really happy with the new MOU and I know you are and and, and I and we support you with that. 
Um, I, I don't want our police to be used as a discipline tool. And, and hopefully the school district is doing some training with their staff, because I'm assuming, you know, you're getting calls from the teachers or the vice principal and um, on some of these issues. And um, I, I just don't think that our police should be there for discipline. If there's an issue, there should be. I agree be. with you 100%. Yeah. 100%. Yeah, so I, I, again, we, I, I back you on, on this completely. Commissioner Norris, I see you have two fingers up like a Boy Scout. Yes, <laughs> I wasn't a Boy Scout, but uh, um, uh, Chief Fry, uh, I want to uh, uh, second what Commissioner Brockington just said. Um, frankly, the, the article uh, was uh, unfortunate the way it was written and the way it was portrayed. And uh, we, in, we, the commissioners, we in Cheltenham, and uh, you as the head of the uh, police department uh, actually uh, should be appropriately stating very proudly that we have a new MOU with the school district. It is better, it's improved, and, and this is a good thing. Um, and it shouldn't have been portrayed uh, as uh, something that we weren't in favor of, as you correctly stated. Um, uh, you know, whether you initiated it or not, uh, um, I understand you initiated, but I'm just saying the the police department in Cheltenham was fully on board with the revision uh, and the school district, and it's a good thing in Cheltenham. So thank you. Yeah, I want to take a, um, a little bit of time right here to also thank Liza Maris for her input and in, in getting involved with this. Liza, just on behalf of our the board of commissioners, we definitely want to thank you for what you did. I know you played a big part in this, so thank you very very much. Any other comments or questions from commissioners on the just, MOU? Just very quick, if I could. Commissioner Arnold. Yeah, uh, I just want to echo the, uh, the the thanks and gratitude to Chief Fry and the police department for the hard work. I know, um, uh, you, you know, th these are these are difficult issues, and um, uh, and it, it's going to result in in what I think is real change um, in the relationship between the police department and the school district, as well as um, the students of the school district. And, and your work, the work of uh, uh, Ms. Maris and uh, uh, Police Free CSD uh, to accomplish this is really um, commendable. So thank you for that. Mr. Chairman. Commissioner Zimitha. Yeah, Chief, I just wanted to compliment you and the staff and obviously Liza, because if you read between the lines, I think directionally the MOU, you know, seeks to decrease uh, interventions and, and reports of less significant incidents. And those are the things that really bog down and confuse the, the problem. I think what you've laid out is the fact that with the serious incidents, we do our job. And the, the, the critical thing is there's two different um, entities that have to be involved here. It's the administration and the teachers and it's the police. So we have to make sure that on the school district side, they're doing their part using the right criteria and taking guidance from you in order to be able to avoid all those incidents that have, you know, quote unquote, the potential to escalate. So congratulations and so much of this, you know, has been triggered by Liza, but also in trying to get things d done in a proper fashion. So you know, press reports uh, aside, um, the acknowledgement here is legitimate and we're the ones who understand why it was done and how it'll have a positive impact. So thanks chief to you and the staff and to Liza as well. Thank you. Thank you, commissioner. Any other comments from commissioners on this? Hearing and seeing none. Um, Joe, do we need to vote to sort of uh, approve the MOU from our end? Uh, Commissioner Brockington, I don't, Liza has her hand raised. Oh, Liza does. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Liza. Thank you. Um, I just want to back up uh, Chief Fry and say that even I think he's being humble in his recounting of the tale that um, his input and support was absolutely instrumental in order to prevent kids from having their lives irre irreverently harmed by a police record. Um, because we've just seen that it's not just in Cheltenham. The three schools that have a black population over 40% are the three schools with the highest number of police referrals across the county, right? And that this is something that's very hard to tackle, 
you know, and it's something that's very hard to, to turn the train around from a lot of the law and order policies that started coming out in the 90s. Um, it's hard to undo things once they've been happening for 30 years. And um, I really just want to say that like Chief Fry's courageous leadership and commitment to doing the right thing um, really was what was bringing about the, the equitable learning environment. Um, I, I spoke to Chief Fry for like three hours and he was on board. It took six months of organizing and getting community support and, and just hassling and hassling and hassling of the school, right? So I also want to say that this 100% number um, is, is, it's not what we want, right? We don't want the 100% of the arrests to be black. And I think that we should not discount what the school, what role the school played in that. Right, because the school's numbers are, are equally disparate, right? So if it's 55% of the population of the school is black, it's 75% of the detentions are black. And then 85% of the suspensions are black, right? And then even slightly more than that, more like 90% of the law enforcement referrals are black. So, so you had half the population being 90% of the referrals before Chief Fry even shows up, right? Like, so it was already a disparate situation when the school picked up the phone. And I know for a fact that that Chief Fry has been more on board with with actually addressing this problem head on and making it better. And that's all I care about, right? I don't really care whose fault it was. I just care that we're making it better. And Chief Fry is 100% on board with that. And I really, I appreciate that. Um, I, I also was disappointed um, that the article didn't tell that part of the story, um, but I mean, that's sort of over now and we can just move forward, but I, I am happy that the article in general was like positive. It was a positive article about Cheltenham. It was a positive article about moving forward. Um, and that even though that number was stressful and even though this is like tricky stuff that we're dealing with, I, I don't know, I think it reflected well on on all, everyone that was involved and that's, you know, like has Cheltenham's name on it. So um, I just wanna thank you again, Chief Fry, and then also all the commissioners for, for your support as well. Um, because it really is a huge change, right? This is, this is hopefully going to make a large change um, for each kid because I don't, I don't know how aware people are, but like children don't receive due process in the same way um, that adults do even in the county, right? That our children are a very vulnerable population, right? In any way that we can protect them, we should. And, and I'm, I'm really optimistic and excited about all of these changes, you know, and I think that we in Cheltenham are taking steps that other people are not in order to protect our children, mm -hmm. um, and particularly yeah. our children of color, so. Or, Mr. I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, well done, yeah. Liza. Yes, well Very said, good. Liza, thank you. Commissioner uh, Armin. Two, two things. Commissioner uh, Francis, uh, Francis Liza, you might want to consider writing a letter to the editor to balance the scales so it shows up in the same publication where the article showed up. Um, also, Chief Deck, or what everybody else is saying, uh, thank you. Uh, extraordinary job you're doing. And if we keep this up, he's going to need a new hat to fit that head in there. It's going to get so swelled up. <laughs> so, Mr. Chairman, if I may, Commissioner Armand, just one more point that that shouldn't be lost here as we um, uh, sort of give give uh, credit where it's due is that. Um, the other aspect is that uh, m my guess is that Liza and, and um, other groups are not done with this with this endeavor here in Cheltenham, that, that, that Cheltenham could potentially serve as a model for other um, relational MOUs between school districts and police departments. And that is something that um, we should all be, I think, very proud of. Um, so. Right. Uh, yeah. I just want to make that one other point. Good, Thank good you, point. Yeah. Well said. Well said. Yep. So, Commissioner Brockington. Uh, yes. The the statute makes the le the law enforcement authority the party to the MOU, but I think the board may want to endorse the MOU or otherwise support it by a vote. Okay. All right. So I would calling, certainly move to endorse. Yeah, calling for a vote to endorse our um, updated MOU between the Sheltonham School District and the Sheltonham Township Police Department. Dan? All, all those in favor of endorsing the MOU say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Great reports tonight. Thank Lieutenant you. Snyder, thank you again. Thank you. We're, we're going to move on to the report from the fire marshal, Mr. Lynch. Good evening, still there? Good evening, Commissioner. How are you? Okay. Good evening, sir. Good. 
Good. Uh, so you have the April 2021 uh, statistics in front of you. Um, not much going on. We're uh, between 20 and 21 this time uh, last year. We we're about 16 calls ahead of where we were, but um, our overall average is about uh, 270 calls less than where we were this time last year. Um, so, uh, it, and again, it's, it, it fluctuates. We have, you know, no way of knowing when there's going to be a call. Um, before I move on to fire board, I just wanted to, with the statistics, um, in 2020, the fire departments assisted me uh, in installing and inspecting smoke detectors in uh, 42 residents. Uh, year to date for 2021, we've already been in 11 homes. And in April, four of those homes we did were in the uh, neighbors of Wincote area. Um, Commissioner Holland over in your ward. Uh, oh, after, after the uh, two fires in that area in the last year, uh, we did have a, an influxuation of uh, requests to make sure the smoke detectors were in proper locations and things like that. So uh, that's where we're at with that. Commissioner Rappaport, you had a question, ma'am? Yeah, no, I was going to thank you. Uh, and and uh, the uh, particularly, I think it was the Glenside team came over to Wincote and installed, um, uh, you know, in the Diva Road area and installed uh, smoke detectors and helped the uh, residents there also, uh, in a sense, in recovery uh, from uh, the devastating fire there. Uh, and uh, also, if uh, I believe Ms. Davidson is still uh, on the line, um, I know she helped to coordinate that too. So big thanks to everybody who was involved in that. Um, I also had a question or two, if you don't mind, while, while I've got the mic. Um, so, uh, again, you, you were very helpful in providing the mutual aid from other um, mm -hmm. the municipalities and explaining that last month, I think, or the month before. Um, but I was hoping that that would be an ongoing part of the statistics uh, so that we could get a, a longitudinal uh, understanding as well as geographical understanding of, of uh, manpower and, and uh, uh, you know, what the dynamics of the whole process. So I'm hoping we're going to see that on a monthly basis. I didn't see that here. Uh, no, um, I'm just about, uh, I'm just about finished May. So from the beginning year to May, and I figured since we're already halfway through June, I would do a six month report and incorporate each month uh, with the statistics that you're requesting and then make it a monthly uh, amendment to the report here. It would just be a, a separate page um, with a different, you know, spreadsheet for you and a breakdown of uh, each company, if you would, uh, responses that they had mutual aid come to them, each company and responses that they had uh, assisted other townships or boroughs surrounding us. Uh, and uh, I can provide the manpower for our companies. I'm working with uh, some of the chiefs outside to try and get, you know, some ballpark numbers of manpower and things like that. Um, and I found a, a way to, uh, in our reporting system, I found a way to recover um, response times and things like that. So, uh, Yes, it's coming, um, and uh, hopefully July you'll have a six-month report, and then moving forward each month it'll be an amendment, it'll be additional report that I provide. Yeah, and, and the response times too, that's terrific, um, because that's, you know, we all know how critical that is. So thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Rappaport. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Me, yes, Commissioner Zygmunt. Thank you. Fire Marshal, I just wanted to, to make an observation and make sure that it's clear. When you go to the category of response in company district, it looks like we're trending this year probably two times higher um, rather than in previous years. In previous years, the number of calls within a district seemed to run about one in six. This year, they're one in three. 
So questions related to that would be, is it the fact that, you know, in consolidating companies, we've also um, changed the territorial allocation with some of the companies. And so there's, you know, both more quick and, and more efficiency in how quickly the, the, the different companies are responding, particularly to fires within their, their assigned districts. Uh, yes, and um, how can I put this? Uh, a lot of COVID was horrible, but in actuality, a lot of businesses are continuing to allow people to work from home. So a lot of our volunteers that would normally be in Center City and Bluebell and something like that in an office building are actually home. So uh, that's why you're, you're seeing more personnel, quicker response times, things like that. Um, as far as uh, more territory to cover, uh, it's, it's not really a significant increase um, covering the additional area. Uh, because for the last seven years, that's been happening already. If that makes sense. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? Seeing none, I call for the approval of the uh, fire marshal report for the month of April 2021. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right. We move on to the report from emergency from EMS from our director, Mr. Ken Hellendahl. Good evening, all. Good evening. Um, just two quick things to add. Um, one is, um, as you know, we're allowing block parties again. Um, mm -hmm. and normally the ambulances come to block parties. We have made a decision at least for the next two months, we will not come to block parties as we have not been for the last year. Um, we're still getting enough COVID patients in the ambulance that we don't find out that they were COVID positive till two, three days later from the hospital. We don't think it's fair to the residents and the kids who always wanna climb in the ambulance to take that risk. So um, we'll, we'll see what the COVID patients are come August and um, may start coming again, but we, we don't think it's fair to our crews or the residents to take the chances of getting COVID. Um, the other thing that'll be in next month's report, but we may need your support before that. And it's something that myself and Chief Fry talked about earlier this week. Um, mental health um, is becoming an increasing um, concern for both the police department and EMS. Um, and um, while we all have training in it, um, the, the ability for us to take people to an appropriate facility to get treatment is declining um, for various reasons. And I, I don't wanna take up the whole um, next 20 minutes. Um, there's already an ambulance association meeting about it. Um, we have the people from um, what we call building 50, which is the Montgomery County Health Services um, have asked to have a meeting with us. Um, and we may ask for your support with the county commissioners for more money um, for the services that are out there. This is a, we are now seeing the result of COVID um, and mental health calls are increasing every day. The police see it, we see it, we're working very well as a team, but we're, we're I don't believe that um, we're, we're, we, we are providing the best service we can, but I'm not sure they're getting what they deserve and need um, after we take them wherever we can get them to go. So um, we may ask for your help with a letter of support once we know what direction you're going in. Thank you, Ken. Any, any questions in reference to EMS for the month? Yeah. Commissioner, yeah. Commissioner Rappaport? Um, and I, I'm, I can't remember whether this is EMS or EMA, but as long as we're on it. Um, I noticed that there's some planning going on already for the um, uh, 20th anniversary of the 9-11 uh, uh, memorial. Um, and, you know, and, and it's, they're looking at, uh, you all are looking at 
of finding choirs and bands and, you know, all well and good. I, you know, that a lot of innocent lives were lost and a lot of heroics were performed and I understand that and appreciate it. What struck me in particular though, this, this last week about that um, is that by the same token, um, we kind of ignored as a township the 100th anniversary over the past a week or two uh, of the Tulsa massacre and the destruction of Black Wall Street. And that just makes me uncomfortable. And I want it on the record that we need to, um, we need to, again, make sure that we are sensitive um, and, uh, and that we are not skewed in our perspective um, and ignoring other huge impacts um, just because, you know, of, uh, you know, a perspective or a popular uh, theme or something like that. So I just, I want to make sure that um, that concern was on record. It's just a strange juxtaposition. Doesn't, doesn't make the 9-11 celebration or memorial any less important. But it does, it does raise other concerns about what we view. So thank you. You're on mute, Irv. Thank you, Commissioner Rappaport. Well stated, Commissioner Zygmuthel. Um, can, can I did have a question. Uh, we have, you know, with our current healthcare provider, um, and as we review the possibility of maintaining or shifting that relationship, uh, they always make the representation that they provide a significant number of uh, additional services for either our residents or, or for uh, employees of the township. And I assume in cases, you know, if we're talking about EMS or firefighters or police, people that are both paid as well as volunteer. I'm wondering if you've explored with our current carrier and if part of the criteria as we look into the potential for evaluating and shifting, if there are some service lines that in fact cover this, that we can have both off-premise and on-premise counseling be made available, particularly if you're recognizing with COVID and to Commissioner Rappaport's point, the the memory of 9-11. Some of us were in New York that day when I was working up there. So I know very well what went on. I wasn't all that far away. So I'm just wondering if there are some things that, that you've explored or if we need as a board and as a management group to be able to look into that. Um, I do know, um, having used it when I came back from 9-11, that um, there, they do have counseling services uh, across the board for you know all, all employees and the responders in particular. Um, due to the nature of what we do, and I don't want to speak for the police chief, but the county has a specific team for first responders that need psychological care and the CISM team, and we use them, and they've been in Cheltenham multiple times for all the emergency services. They are fantastic. For people at EMS that have had personal issues with personal calls, um, we have reached out to what Divot provides and they have been outstanding. Um, we also, um, you know, the EAP program honestly has been very good. Obviously it's personal as a department head, I don't know about it. I just know that several employees have said they've used it and found it to be excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments from commissioners? All right. Seeing none, I call for the approval of the Emergency Management Service Director's Report for the month All of April. in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Can we move on to Emergency Management Coordinator Report for the month? Um, I have nothing to add to the report except a little bit of good news for her, bad news for me. Um, the 25th of the month, um, Kim will be leaving on maternity leave, so she's pretty happy. Uh, I'm losing my right-hand person for a while, 
Um, but they've been trying for a long time to have a baby. So we're all very happy for. Her. So I just um, didn't want you to look for a report from the deputy coordinator next month because the only report will be that she's not sleeping very well and the baby's keeping her awake. So um, we all can congratulate her. Long time coming. I just want and, to make the board and please, please wish her well from the board of commissioners. I will. Thank you. And I have nothing else to add. All right, so we will, re re uh, even though there was no report, I will ask for their approval. Of the All those in favor report. say aye. 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 We're moving on to the report from our township manager. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will take my three hour presentation uh, down to probably five minutes, if that's okay. Uh, no, I want three hours. Okay, all right, well, very good. <laughs> Put it in public works. <laughs> um, <laughs> Just an update, a quick update on the solar stop sign installation. Um, I want to thank Public Works for the installation of those. Uh, some of the feedback I know from myself sitting and uh, monitoring that uh, and spoke with Sergeant uh, Tyler this afternoon in his monitoring. Um, we've noticed that people are slowing down. I think those who are going to roll through stop signs will continue to roll through stop signs, even if there were search lights and flashing lights, <laughs> they would still continue to do that. Mm -hmm. um, I know that uh, our public works director was at a event and residents came up to him and that live right around these signs and commented to him that they have noticed a significant difference with people stopping with those being out there. Um, so we'll continue to the test program on those um, and uh, I plan to myself go and knock on some doors of residents in those areas where the signs are at um, and just get their feedback from residents who live there 24 seven, 365. Um, myself, uh, the police, you know, they're not there all day to be able to monitor that. And uh, I'm sure people will be more compliant uh, with a police car sitting there, not far away, but I know talking to the Sergeant today, it seems like people don't really care. <laughs> If there's a police car there or not, they continue to roll through the signs uh, and they will be enforced uh, by our police department. Um, so uh, I know that uh, Allison, if you wanted to pop that up real quick, um, and we just stepped through the signs and install. I know Irv, I believe your committee touched base on those yesterday. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, uh, Again, we'll continue to monitor these as part of the traffic calming. Uh, one segment of this, uh, we know that we have to make a correction on Tookany Creek Parkway where the pedestrian signs are, which uh, Public Works has monitored. Notice people do stop for those when people are within the crosswalk. So uh, something we'll continue to go through. Alice, if you just want to, you can just step through them relatively quickly um, of the installs. Uh, I know that the sergeant mentioned today that uh, we'll probably look at some of the higher crash areas uh, in the township uh, to potentially uh, look to add maybe a set and try. Hey, hey, higher crash can, areas. can we can we go back one, Allison? Can you go back that one there? Now my understanding that sign is actually in the wrong location that it should be on Jenkintown and not took any. And I should be on Tookany Creek and not on Jenkintown. We will look into that, Chief. I don't know if that's the correct one. I know that there's a stop bar painted on the ground there, so we would have to remove the stop bar if. if yeah, because my understanding in our traffic calming uh, meeting was that particular location, the signs were put up incorrectly. That the signs now are on Jenkintown Road, but those stop signs should be on Tookany Creek Parkway. That's, well, that's what it was our original, that's what we had envisioned it to be, but, um, you know. Uh, so you, you originally wanted it to be on Tookany Creek? Correct. Jenkins. Yeah, and I think um, Public Works put them on Jenkintown by mistake, Bob. Yeah, and we're so, going to go ahead, we're going to go ahead and make that correction. Right. And replace those. Or put four, put, buy two new ones and put that's them on. The, uh, Commissioner them Brockington, absolutely. It would help if they were on both ways. Yeah, I, I, yeah, just put two new ones out there. All in favor, aye, right, move, keep going. <laughs> uh, but but uh, I know also too, and Chief, you know, if, if this doesn't come out right, but um, Sergeant Tyler mentioned it'll probably take one full year 
to be able to see the success of these based on crash details, um, citations being issued to be able to give a full analysis of the success of these uh, particular signs. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct, sir. All right, so this is the installation process. Yes, so we are, uh, it shows what, what has been done. Uh, appreciate Public Works doing that. And uh, we will be back probably in another uh, three months uh, after uh, we've been able to gather some input from residents uh, of what their opinion is of how these are going. Okay. The cost. And that's all I have. Okay, thank you. All right, we're going to go now to any old business for public safety for the month of June. Hearing none. Any new business for public safety for the month of June? Commissioner, you're breaking up. Commissioner Ransky. There we go. Um, I'm breaking up. Wait, wait. I, I can hear you sort of sometimes. Um, I have one issue to bring up. Uh, some uh, residents have brought to my attention. Um, it is the plantings and the design on Shelton Hills and Widener. And I know there are a couple of people who'd like to speak about that because they are concerned that this was moved forward before the residents adjacent to that area were even asked. And uh, the, several of them have said, no, they don't wanna see this. They wanna leave it open for visibility and other purposes. Commissioner, if I may, on that, um, we had the uh, police department go out and do a survey of this in which it was determined that um, if plantings were to go in, uh, they would have to be two feet or less. Right. Uh, I, they I'm had some other, other concerns, and that project is on hold until next month's public works meeting in which it will some more additional data will be um, collected and then uh, fully discussed at the Mr. next public works Mr. Manager, in July. Yes, Mr. Manager, I'm familiar, thank you. Um, the issue wasn't the kind of plantings. The issue was plantings or not. Uh, one of the things they had mentioned was stone pavers, uh, which would have taken off the grass and the green space we tried to preserve. Um, and I think there's one or two residents who do wanna say something about their objections to this and it can come back up again if necessary, I guess, in public works. Okay, can we um, have those residents, we have them go ahead and make a comment. Yeah. Sure, hi, hi. Um, I'm Bonnie Klein. I live at 643 Widener Road and I did speak a little bit last week too. Um, so, so revisiting this issue, um, I'm not 100% sure, certain how to present it. Do I go back and repeat all of my concerns from last week or, or do we defer to the police review of the intersection? No, I think right now, Bonnie, we, we have the information from the police. So I don't think we need to revisit, you know, that information. We kind of, we all sort of know the concerns, but we can kind of go forward with what your feeling is, but I don't think we need to rehash it because we kind of know. Okay, so, well, you know, so um, basically I'll reiterate just the fact that it is a very dangerous intersection. I've, my family and I have lived at this house for 50 years and honestly, we find it so dangerous that we don't even turn there because of the blind turns and the hills on Chelton Hills. Um, and, and the one thing, I mean, I guess I was informed that um, a suggestion might be made to keep plantings at two feet. And so the concern is then what happens with long-term maintenance? Who's going to enforce that? Um, the plantings are that were purchased are four feet and three feet high. And it just seems like I'm really concerned about long-term care. I'm familiar with the public garden at Custis Woods and, and the garden at um, the Melrose Park train station. I recently learned about that too, that the people who plant them quickly lose interest most often. They become overgrown, unsightly. This is in a very busy road. It could interfere with traffic with safety even more than than already is um and it's true that there are other residents here who live much closer than i do um i'm about a block away i'm an avid gardener that's something else i really want to emphasize i actually think that the idea of a butterfly garden 
in Elkins Park or in the township would be wonderful. I just don't think that this is the best location. And I believe um, that maybe a location like the Rock Lane Park, which is away from traffic, it's already a green <coughs> space. It might be a beautiful location for it. And it just, I'm very concerned about the safety issue. And again, just like uh, Commissioner Pransky said, um, preservation of green space and, um, and safety, not only to the cars, but to the pedestrians who might be there to enjoy, enjoy the space. Um, so. Thank you. Do you have any Thank questions? You, or, you're, wel you're welcome. Thank you. you Are there any anything? other residents? Brad, is there anyone else that you know? One? I, 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 I see the James Scott profile is trying <laughs> to talk, but I'm hearing no sound. Can you unmute James? No. There they are. <laughs> they're unmuted, but they're freezing up. Tur you're Try turning off your video and talking. Let's, we'll see if your sound comes through. Or try mine. Can you do that screen share too, Brad, of that picture? Because I think they might want to talk about that. Uh, the, unfortunately, the way you sent the picture was not a JPEG. Uh, so that might be a little bit difficult to do. Mm, OK, sorry. All right, well, we're going to move forward. Do, the fact do you want me to talk project, for them? I, I, so no, I, Bonnie, I'm, I mean, Bonnie, the fact that this project is on hold right now, mm -hmm. I mean, so it, it's not going anywhere right now. And I think okay. that, you know, we, we understand everybody's concerns. And I think that once we are, you know, are ready to get this train moving again with the residents, voices will be heard. And we will see what happens at that point. But right now, this project is on hold. Okay, I do want to share one other thing. Um, all I know is that Karen and James are opposed to it as well, and they live right there. And and Kara sent me a picture that it's already um, the visibility is already obstructed, and any plantings they really feel will make it worse. I also did receive an email from their neighbors, Erica Witherspoon and Jeff Shindell, who live at six sixteen Widener Road, and which is also pretty much adjacent, adjacent to the area in question. And they wrote, the turn at Widener and Shelton Hills is very difficult and a safety hazard already. We certainly do not need plants or flowers on the island, making a hazardous turn even more dangerous. And they put it as a side note that the car speeds so much on Shelton Hills that they would actually like to have speed bumps on, in that location, so. Thank you, Bonnie. I'm going to just jump in for a second. Um, I think Commissioner Brockington and everybody has heard the comments. They realize that uh, the Scots would like to talk, but they'll have to fix their tech there to do that. And it's going to come up next month anyway, I believe you said, Irv. Yes. Um, so those points could be made out at the appropriate time then. Right. Okay. So what is the date? Do you know? I'm sorry. What is the date that will come up? July 7th, I believe. July the 7th, Bonnie. July 7th. And will it come up at the commissioner's meeting next week? No. 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 It's on okay. Hold. All right. It's on hold. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I think, uh, can you hear us now? Yes. Okay. I joined via my cell phone. I'll keep it quick. I know it's late and I know Bonnie covered a lot of everything, but my husband and I moved here a year ago. Um, we live two houses up from the intersection and we do just find it um, very dangerous. When we first moved in, we're like, oh, what a cool plot of land that could be beautiful with some flowers. And then within the first few days of us living here, we quickly realized um, how hard it was to turn on to our street from Shelton Hills with that blind curve. And to the point where when people visit us, I have to warn them about making that left turn so they don't get rear-ended. Um, and both my neighbor, um, Jeff, who wrote the email and I, we both have young children, my child's four months old, his child's three years old. So there are children in the neighborhood that drive frequently to the intersection, just, you know, any, whatever we can do to improve safety, we're, you know, here to su support that. 
we love gardens for sure. Um, but you know, we, we do want to make sure that safety is a, a high concern. And also, you know, all this transpired via Facebook, which was kind of alarming to us. And many of my neighbors don't have Facebook. So that, you know, just the whole process of the garden, how it moved forward was just a little surprising and nerve wracking for us. So, you know, I um, just want to thank you for, you know, having this at your meeting and, and thank you for, um, you know, reconsidering this. Thank you for your comments. Thank you very much. All right, guys, we're going to move on to, I guess we can call it citizen forum part two. Um, any, any other issues in reference to public safety for citizen forum? Allison, any citizens still around? Um, doesn't look like it. Okay. I'm going to call for the adjournment of tonight's. Oh, wait, uh, Commissioner Brockington. Yes. Uh, this is uh, Tom Murr from Bishop Egan, Bishop Egan, Bishop McTevitt High School. Uh, I don't know if I yeah. missed my cue. I don't, I don't think I did, but uh, I, Sir, I'm here on behalf of the school. Is this, is this the time to bring this up? The, about... very, next, the very next meeting you're on. Okay. Uh, Ashley called me today. She said I should be ready to go tonight. All right. Yes. It is, yeah, the next, it's the next it meeting. Right We're going to adjourn this one and start the next one, Doc. Oh. In about fi about fifteen minutes, but just stay on. Just stay on. Okay, I'll and stand I, by. I see two more meetings. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> yes. All those in favor of adjourning, say aye. 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 aye.